Thank you for having me, Lorraine. It's such a gift to be here. You know, living in Utah, I thought national parks were our backyard because in Utah we have Zion, Bryce, Capitol Reef, Arches, and Canyonland, and it's really where we spent our time. And if you go north, um, five hours, you have Grand Teton National Park and Yellowstone. So this was where we were raised. And I thought, I, you know, I so love public lands, um, our public commons. And I thought, you know, it would be a wonderful thing to explore our national parks. And I thought, this is the one thing I do know. And as you say, as I um, became more deeply immersed in this, I realized I know nothing. Um, it became a book about America in both shadow and light. And I think, you know, every writer has to ask herself, um, by what authority do I write? And that was a struggle for me with this book because I thought, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm not a National Park employee. I'm not a public lands attorney. Um, I'm not a historian. So where is my authority? And I had to face that my authority is as a citizen, as a storyteller, as a lover of these lands. And it really asked everything and more of me. Would you believe me if I told you I thought about a dinner party? And, you know, Brooke and I live in the desert in Castle Valley, Utah, very near Arches, alongside the Colorado River. And we have a table that seats 12. So I thought, all right, if we had 12 national parks to dinner, who would that be? And it was very obvious who the heads of the table would be. It would be Canyonlands, which is where we live, and it would be Grand Teton National Park, which I really call my mother park. Mm -hmm. I was raised there. And so I knew they would be the anchors. And then I thought about those parks that would be in the middle, um, who I know not well, but they're trustworthy. And that would be Acadia National Park in Maine and Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. And then I thought, um, who would be my dream parks? You know, I know people that know them, but the parks that I've never been to, and that would be Big Bend National Park in Texas, which if I ever disappear, Lorraine, <laughs> I will be there. Um, Arctic National, not the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, but Gates of the Arctic. Um, that would be one of my dream parks that I'd never been to. And where was the other one? Then I thought, you know, who's the family member? Who's the guest that you have to invite? Um, yeah. But it's so complicated, you know, you worry. That for me was Glacier National Park yeah. because I was afraid I wouldn't know how to tell that story of climate change, of the treatment of Blackfeet people and the betrayal of the National Park Service to the Blackfeet. So that was another member at the table. Then there were those who... I knew would bring the conversation to a deeper level, sometimes uncomfortable. Um, Gettysburg, talking about the Civil War and slavery. Um, Alcatraz, talking about prisons and um, incarceration. And the other one was the Gulf Island National Seashore, mm -hmm. um, BP oil spill. Tough, tough parks, but with a big story to tell. Then there was the guest that made all the difference, and that was Cesar Chavez, right. that really brought environmental issues into social issues, and he changed the weather system. The other park that was the surprise guest to me was um, Effigy Mounds, and that's the park that really undid me. Um, in the Midwest, in Iowa, on the banks of the Mississippi River, truly a sacred site. Um, marching bears, a falcon with a wingspan over 200 feet wide. And I think about that place all the time. So those were my guests. And uh, I can't tell you what they taught me. And I felt in so many ways they were representative of the place we call America. And there's certainly parks that I love um, who have been other guests yeah. at other dinner parties. That would be Yosemite. Um, it would be the Grand Canyon, Everglades, 
I mean, there's just so many. And you realize so much of our identities as Americans are rooted in our national parks. And again, um, in both shadow and light. And I think it made me fall more deeply in love with the United States. And especially now when, you know, in my own personal um, landscape, it's been a very difficult time after the 2016 election. And when we see how threatened our public lands are, how the budgets are being cut in our national parks and monuments. And I look at a park, a monument like Bears Ears in Utah, um, that, you know, our congressional delegation um, is trying to rescind, or at the very least gut. And um, this is not an easy time, and I, I think we have to use our voice. I'm not sure that they're new. They may be <laughs> very old. Um, acts of civil disobedience, which Henry David Thoreau inspired in his essay. Um, certainly we've seen acts of civil disobedience and direct action in the civil rights movement. And so I think it's just another incarnation of a sacred act, as far as I'm concerned. And I do think each of us, with the gifts that are ours, in the communities where we dwell, have to think about um, what is our reflective act of activism. Is it direct action? Is it calling our senators? Is it writing, if that is our gift? And um, in that in that vein, I think this is an awakened moment, and I just feel so strongly that we have to really work hard to make sure that the open space of democracy remains open, and that this isn't going to be a moment um, where we look back and say, this was a fossil fuel coup or a climate change coup by the industry that cares nothing about other species besides themselves. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, and I think it's that notion of community that includes all life forms, plants, animals, rocks, rivers, and human beings. The eyes of the future are looking back at us, and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. They are kneeling with hands clasped that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to come. To protect what is wild is to protect what is gentle. Perhaps the wilderness we fear is the pause between our own heartbeats, the silent space that says we live only by grace. Wilderness lives by this same grace. Wild mercy is in our hands. Senator Udall told me that prior to this election that he would receive 50 calls a day. Now they're receiving <coughs> over 500 calls today. That's another form of direct action. And again, it's how we use our voices. But you know, people talk about what would New York City, what would Manhattan be without Central Park? What would America be without Yosemite, without Grand Canyon, without Yellowstone, without Canyonlands, without Big Bend? Um, without Chaco Canyon, which is now, as you know, under threat, right here, just outside Santa Fe. So I think we, the time has come where we have to stand our ground and hold the ground together. I mean, just, you know, the quality of light, to see a night sky of stars, um, to hear the call cry of coyotes howling at night. Um, the other day, we saw the first movement of rattlesnake you know, awakening mm. from mm. dormancy. And, uh, you know, it's such a pleasure and privilege to live in the American Southwest. I mean, you think about the cranes that come down each fall as blessings from the sky. I mean, I could not live anywhere else because it does remind us what it means to be human and that we, as you say, are not the only species that live and breathe on this planet. That's why I teach there in the spring because I can see out <laughs> by the time all the green envelops me, I, I have to tell you, I really get claustrophobic. Well, this is very poignant for me, Lorraine, today, because today is my mother's birthday. She would be, let me think, she would be 85 today as we mm. speak. So I really honor her. And, you know, I think we all carry our dead with us. Um, and the relationship continues. Here's what happened. 
Um, my mother was dying of ovarian cancer. I was laying in bed with her, rubbing her back, and she said to me, Terry, I'm leaving you all my journals, but you have to promise me that you won't look at them until after I'm gone. Honestly, I didn't know my mother kept journals. She was a deeply private person, and I gave her my word, and she told me exactly where they were, and then we went on talking about other things. A week later, she passed. It was a full moon. A month later, after she died, I went back into the family home and I thought, now, now I could look at her journals and know what she was really feeling. They were exactly where she said they were. Three shelves of beautifully bound journals in fabric, leather, each one distinct. I opened the first one, it was empty. I opened the second one, it was empty. I opened the third, the fourth, the fifth, and sixth, all of them were empty, shelf after shelf after shelf. All my mother's journals were blank. Well, I did for 25 years. Uh. And, you know, I, it was like a second death, um, the disappointment. And I kept thinking, why? Why would she do this? Why would one after another, each one unique, why would she leave them to me? W why? And I, I couldn't think about it. My grief was such, you know, my mother and I were so close, I just couldn't deal with it. So I unceremoniously just gathered them all, put them in the back seat of my Subaru, went back up the canyon, put them on my shelves, and honestly, I just wrote in all of them. Um, I did notice, though, that in each one I would say, this is one of Mother's journals. And maybe I left two. Um, it wasn't until I found myself in my own health crisis as a woman of 54, the age my mother was when she died, that I thought if only I could talk to mother to find out what she was thinking. Mm. And then I realized, huh, I maybe now you can think about what was she saying about empty space? What was she saying about leaving her journals blank? Was it a gesture saying, fill them? Or was it an act of defiance? Um, or was she so busy living her life because she knew that her years were, were few, that she didn't have time? You know, I will never know. But When Women Were Birds really allowed me to explore um, what our voices are as women, how a winged community flourishes, and how if one woman remains silent, um, other women get hurt. So. In many ways, I think this was the book where I was able to really explore my own voice through my mother's absence of voice. Well, it was the 54 years, um, it was the age she was when she died, and I think it was the age I was when I became aware of the power of our voices mm -hmm. and to honor that. I will, and you know, I really still don't know what it means when women were birds. Um, it came to me in a dream, but I trust it. Mm -hmm. How shall we live? Once upon a time, when women were birds, there was the simple understanding that to sing at dawn and to sing at dusk was to heal the world through joy. The birds still remember what we have forgotten, that the world is meant to be celebrated. How... How did you write it? How did you do this? You know, it's a really great question. Um, I think you do it one word at a time. Mm -hmm. And I always, when I go to my study, I light a candle and I realize that something else is coming through me, that it is in a, a different time and space. And for me, it's, it's the landscape of story. And one sentence leads you to the next. Um, I do a lot of my work, what I would call night work. If I have a question, I put it into my, my night mind, my dreamy mind. And in the morning when I wake up, usually um, there is an answer or an image or I know where I go next. And that's, to me, the wisdom of morning mind. So um, where does this come from? It comes from the truth of our lives. And, and I think it comes from the stories that allow us to be who we are both the mistakes we've made and um, 
the moments where we see something or something surprises us or our secrets. So um, this book in many ways is, is my journal in response mm. to my mother's journals. Mm. So it is deeply personal and I'm glad that I don't know if anyone's read it because I would probably would be red faced. And that's really, you know, that's the last paragraph of the book. And I think we begin in emptiness and we end in emptiness. And, and in between those, we fill our lives with, with love. Um, and again, shadow light, you know, what, what we reflect. And I think um, my mother did give me a great gift. And it is ambiguity and mystery. And, uh, and the recognition that as women, we must speak the language women speak when there is no one there to correct mm. us. Absolutely. And to be comfortable in the silences. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's really where our knowledge comes from. And for me, that is also the stillness of open spaces. Open spaces, open minds, open hearts. No separation. I think our most powerful gesture is to stand our ground in the places we call home. So in New Mexico, um, you have Chaco Canyon, you know, and New Mexico has a tremendous um, tradition of, of responding to social injustices. You also have a fantastic um, delegation. Yes. And I mean, I just think, why couldn't you to have someone like Senator Udall or Senator Heinrich, you know, or a state senator like Nathan Small? And, you know, it's rough in Utah, I have to tell you. You know, we have Rob Bishop, who right now has a bill before Congress that wants to sell off our public lands for $50 million. We have Jason Chaffetz, who I don't even know where to begin, and is leading the charge to rescind Bears Ears National Monument. Mm -hmm. um, we have a governor who basically said goodbye to the outdoor industry. And all they were asking is, can you give us your word that you won't sell public lands into private hands? And he wouldn't. Mm. Um, nor would he say that they wouldn't uh, rescind or gut, uh, minimize Bears Ears, which is such um, an act of disrespect also to the tribes, to the intertribal commission, Hopi, Navajo, Zuni, and the two Ute nations. Um, so what can we do? As a Utahn, I am calling my delegation every single day. They do not take my calls, but still the gesture. And we're organizing and we're trying to support the tribes. And, you know, the spiritual leaders, um, Jonah Yellowman among them, who is a Navajo elder, they're praying and they're doing ceremonies. And that matters. And so I think each of us, again, has to find our own gesture, the essential gesture. Um, where we realize our public lands are our public commons. It's part of our identities. And so I think each person in their own community, in their own states, look and see where your public lands are, where your national parks and monuments are, and let your congressional delegation know what they mean to you. And I keep thinking if there's enough outrage and uprising, then we will protect our home ground. It's a different kind of homeland security. And uh, I remember wow. meeting um, a vet, um, Bill Summers, in Big Bend National Park. And he said, this is my duty mm. as a former vet, you know, as a military person. This is, these are the boundaries I'm protecting, not a wall that is keeping wildlife and human beings out, but rather the spiritual engagement in. And I love that idea. Well, I'm so charmed by that turn of phrase, another meaning of homeland security. and I'm Not one based on fear, right. but based on love. Yeah, yes.